The following is an interview with one of the most accomplished documentary filmmakers, Alex Gibney. He made documentaries about Lance Armstrong, Steve Jobs, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, Elizabeth Holmes, the Church of Scientology, the Enron Corporation and many, many more. He was awarded a Golden Frog during the Kammer Image Film Festival in Poland, where I got a chance to talk to him. Some golden nuggets ahead, especially for documentary editors, so enjoy! How did the editing experience you have informed your work as a documentary director and producer? Because like rewrite the story in the editing process a little bit more or much more than in narrative filmmaking. Yeah, it's interesting because I, as you say, I did start as an editor at first for trailers, uh -huh. uh, recuts of, of foreign films. I remember I recut a Paul Verhoeven film. I recut a Bill Forsyth film. Um, for for American release, and then ultimately, you know, went on to to edit uh, some other scripted films. You can't write, you can't make a film in the cutting room, uh, or rarely mm -hmm. can you make a film in the cutting room uh, if the director hasn't done a good job of shooting it. But in documentaries, you can make a film in the cutting room, um, and sometimes by going back out and shooting more that you didn't realize that you needed. Yeah. Um, which actually some interesting scripted filmmakers do. They save money mm -hmm. for a moment when uh, in the editing process they realize, oh my God, I should have written this scene, you know, and they, they go out and shoot it. What being a, a fiction film editor did teach me, and I was also a documentary editor too, mm -hmm. but what fiction film editing did teach me was about rhythm, about tone, uh, and about, you know, telling a story. And then what, um, what being an editor of more cinema verite films taught me was that you need to be prepared to engage with the material and elevate material that you didn't expect to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you realize in the cutting room, oh, this is incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas on a scripted film, you have the script and you can choose takes, but um, it's rare that you, you see something and you realize, oh my God, that's fantastic. Let's change everything in order to invest in that. Yeah. So the ability to be surprised in the cutting room and to change the structure of the film in order to account for material that's much better than the original structure allowed for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in, in, when we did the film about Enron, you know, it was it was to some extent launched off of a book called Smartest Guys in the Room. But there's very little in that book about uh, the California energy crisis. But we got a, a, our hands on a huge number of audio tapes of Enron traders laughing gleefully uh -huh. as they ripped off the state of California and literally shut the lights down for profit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and so we invested in that. We change the story in order to make that California part of the story much more important. You know, th that wasn't the original intent. That was something we discovered in the editing room. Yeah, that's a shift you can do in documentary if you're making, right? Yes. Not really in narrative. Yeah. I mean, in narrative, you, you, you can like restructure things, right? But you can't change the focus of the story. Right. That's right. You can't. And, unless it, it becomes a, you know, a very innovative film. You have this script which is determining what you can do. And also it's built into the production process. Like in a feature film, you know, you have so many people on set and you're paying them a day rate um, to reassemble them is hugely expensive. True. Whereas in a documentary, you have a crew of three people yeah, yeah. Um, and you can go back out into the field and, and get stuff that you hadn't thought to get the first time around. In your films, you, you very often like, you know, highlight lies that organizations feed us or, or people who are well known, right? So how do you get those famous people, for lack of a better word, right, in front of the camera, even though like they are aware that you will highlight maybe not so beneficial point of view on their story? Huh. You know, well, let's just say yeah. that I don't always get them. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think <laughs> when I do, it's usually a combination of the arrogance of the subject, mm -hmm. and also to some extent, 
my ability to convince them that even if I'm critical, I'll be fairly critical. Mm -hmm. You know, in the case of, I did a film called The Armstrong Lie about Lance Armstrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I discovered midway through the film that actually I was being used by Lance Uh, as a kind of a promotional tool for Mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Um, And that he felt confident enough that he could, you know, lay things out. So much so that they allowed me, for example, to talk to um, Michela Ferrari, the doping doctor, mm-hmm. that was so instrumental in Lance's success. Now, I think he was actually more than a doping doctor, but he had no moral issue whatsoever with doping. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was interesting to me. It was like, we've got this story so that he can investigate as much as he wants, but he's not going to find anything. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there's a certain arrogance to that. Uh, and also a certain understanding that charm will seduce, you know, people who come in mm-hmm, contact mm-hmm, and so forth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So arrogance of the subject, but also, you know, I, I, I honestly try very hard. There was a um, former head of the CIA, Michael Hayden, who sat down uh, for me twice. And, you know, there are, let's just say I have strong disagreements with Michael Hayden mm-hmm. about a lot of issues. Yeah. But I think Hayden... Uh, trusted me to present his point of view fairly in the context of the documentary. Mm -hmm. Even though the film may not agree with him, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. his point of view is presented fairly. That is to say, I'm not um, cutting and pasting his words in in ways that don't represent what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I recall you you said something like that it's possible to like someone even though you're disagreeing with what they say. Correct. But very often, we we connect those two things. Yes. how someone feels. So, for example, I have a friend, right? He disagrees with me on a, I don't know, an issue of climate change, right? right. And very often that will change my, my perspective of that person. Like it will right. make me like them less. Right. So I think that, you know, even though people realize that it's not the same, very few people can like, you know, make these things separate, right? Right. So how do you feel about that aspect with subjects of your field? I mean, I think the tension is what makes it interesting. And one of the problems with social media, particularly anonymized social media, Mm -hmm. is that you never actually come in contact with the person that you may be criticizing or trolling or harassing. And when you do, you have to reckon with them as human beings. Mm -hmm. When I started out, I viewed the process more distantly. And also Mm -hmm. when you make films that sometimes hold people to account or are critical of people, you have a kind of awesome responsibility to be willing to look them in the eye, even if you're affectionate toward them, or even if you like them or are charmed by them or whatever, and say, you know, I have a gas hanging out with you, but I think you're wrong. I, I just think you're wrong. Um, or to to sit in the cutting room, which is an exercise I often think about, mm-hmm and go through every section of the film uh, and think if that person who's the subject of the film were to be sitting here next to me, Mm -hmm. um, would I be able to defend everything that I'm doing to them in person? Oh, I love it. Right? I love it. So uh, that's what goes through my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's tricky. There's a lot of discussion now about the obligation that filmmakers should have to their subjects. Yeah, yeah. And I take that very seriously. At the same time, I think that the ultimate obligation that a filmmaker has is to his or her um, audience. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes subjects, you don't want to be in the position of making commercials for your subjects. Yeah. Uh, Because sometimes subjects aren't truthful, either intentionally or unintentionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and your job as a filmmaker is to get at some kind of essential truth. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you get someone like Lance, right, Armstrong, and yeah, he's, as you said, he was like cocky that he's probably going to outsmart you. In right. Way, right. Yeah. So you're not getting like an authentic performance out of them, so to speak. Like performance right. is, not, is not the best word here, but you know what I mean, right? I'm you getting a performance and yeah, it's a convincing get, you one. You get the performance, exactly, <laughs> right. So it's pretty much to editing to say how it really is, right? Yes, that's right. It's in the editing room that you have to find a way of conveying what you think. 
mm-hmm. even if and 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 that includes um, material you disagree with, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. uh, there's one of my favorite lines from a filmmaker hero of mine, Marcel Ophuls. He said, "I always have a point of view. The trick is." showing how hard it was to get to that point of view. <laughs> so in the editing, I think it's, y- you need to guide the audience to where you as an author are going, but not in a way which is too closed, because then you can't convey how hard it is to get to where you got. And also then you don't let the, the viewer in who may agree or disagree with you. You have to create a world that's that's full of enough contradictions like real life to be able to um, reckon w- w- with the truth properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder, like, you, you're you making films for 40-something years, right? Yeah. Right? So are there films that you changed your point of view on right now? Like, Oh, you mean do I look back and say, gosh, I was wrong about that? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, it's interesting, too, because recently a group of filmmakers anonymously came to, well, they weren't anonymous to me, but they didn't come out publicly. They just reached out to me by email and asked me to denounce one of my own films, uh, which was We Steal Secrets, the one on Assange, because it was going on Netflix and, you know, he's in legal jeopardy and there's aspects of the film that are critical to Assange. Well, first of all, I found it weird that filmmakers would ask me to denounce a film. Uh-huh. Uh, that doesn't feel like um, good filmmaking. But but it, it made me reckon with it and go back and watch it and decide, well, did I get it wrong? And I guess there may have been some things I wish I had done slightly differently, but I don't feel within the context of what I did that I got it wrong. Um I think if my film about Armstrong had come out, The Road Back, the first film, because we were, we, were, we were done. If that film had come out, it would have been an embarrassment, I think. Yeah. So that's, but I think that in terms of what we're talking about, so I don't think there's any film of mine I would go back and say, because you also have to reckon that each film you make is a kind of, vivisection of a certain moment in time yeah um and so i think i i'm proud of my films in terms of being accurate representations of that moment Uh um but also i think that because my films tend to include points of view i don't agree with that they hold up longer Uh than just lecturing about a certain topic true i mean it's i think it's even true for for narratives uh, when someone is trying to get their agenda for the door with right. a narrative film like people don't connect with it like that that's that film will not be relevant in a few years right right uh, the best films are those that like leave the open door for discussion right i want to go back to that truth aspect <laughs> in a way because i think like you know it, winston churchill was known for changing his mind on many subjects and Sure, he was doing it for political reasons to a great extent. But still, I think that like the most dangerous people are those who will not change their mind under whatever evidence they might be presented, right? Right. Mm-hmm. As a documentary filmmaker, you are creating your version of truth in a way. So how huge is that responsibility? It's a huge responsibility. And you have to think about it very carefully. That's why the editing of my films takes a long time, uh-huh. generally speaking. And in some ways, you know, it, it's kind of like the process that actors often go through when they're portraying villains, uh-huh. for example. Uh-huh. No good actor wants to portray somebody who's all bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. That's, not a, that's not portraying a human being, yeah. right? Um, and I think that there is such a tendency in today's world to make snap judgments Mm -hmm. about um, people's essential characters Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than focus on actions and and how complex they may be as human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh-huh. Um, but to, to say that you're going back to what we we're talking about, to say that you like somebody, but you disagree with them, that's not a cop out. Yeah. It, it can be for real. So I think it is a huge responsibility to try to portray life in, in, in some sense of complexity and yet also argue for a moral vision. Because you don't want to just say, well, everybody, I always think there's a line in a film out of the past I always remember. And there's some guy, some character who works in a hotel. He says, I always think everyone's right. <laughs> and he says that because he doesn't want anybody to think ill of him but that's not a movie you want to make yeah, where yeah, yeah. everyone's right yeah, yeah. Um, no uh, there are issues there were real issues of right and wrong yeah, yeah, right yeah. And, and I reckon with those but imagining that when somebody does the wrong thing they're an essentially bad person yeah. takes us I think to a terrible place. Mm-hmm. It's interesting if you talk to people who've been criminal prosecutors for many years. Yeah, they see their job as judging actions. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That said, very often in a court of law, when they're trying to persuade a jury to find them guilty, they often veer into the territory of character. Yeah. To basically yeah. say. Yeah look at this person and conclude that they are a bad person because that's our human instinct yeah, yeah. is like, if you do something bad, you must be a bad person. Yeah. Were you always, was it easy for you to disagree with these subjects of your films? Was it something that I find out, I, 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 I will be honest and say yeah. in the moment, yeah. I have a terribly hard time mm-hmm. disagreeing with subjects because I feel, first of all, I feel my job is not to lay out my point of view to the subject but it's to listen to their point of view. So that's number one. That's my job is to get them to tell me what they think. Uh But also, even if I'm getting into a contentious discussion in 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 the context of an interview, in person, I have a great deal of difficulty. You know, I was, I was grown up with, uh, you know, my parents got divorced very early on. And I think that that made me averse to conflict. Uh And I had to teach myself to become better at that. But even now, I don't think I'm particularly good at it. So to some extent, you know, I rely on the editing room to, um, to reckon with what's been said to me and whether or not that, that's truthful. At the same time, to do so within the context of knowing how much power I have in the editing room. So I, I can't abuse that power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm averse to conflict as well. I, I mean, I am, and I think many people are. Right, but that's not always the best course of action. Right, especially when you're making a film where you want to, where you want to maybe not take a stand statement, but but start the discussion in the community. Right, I, I want to once again go back to that truth aspect because uh, I always find it interesting how Werner Herzog <laughs> approaches the topic. Oh, so, the ecstatic truth. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and you know he he takes it to extreme and. Uh, He places, for example, quotes in his films that aren't real, right? Do you feel it's too far or do you, do, do you sympathize with this, that aspect, that topic of ecstatic truth? Werner's a wonderful character and I think a magnificent filmmaker. Um, and he almost always says things to provoke. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I hate storyboards. Uh, right. Th- those are used by cowards. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. And uh, where I remember he said once about, I was on a panel with him and he said once, um, we were talking about documentary filmmaking and he said, a lot of people talk about um, being a fly in the wall. Yeah. I say, don't be a fly, be a wasp and sting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So, <laughs> I think I watched this interview. <laughs> and so, um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I have a problem with, Every film has its own rules, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I've used actors in my films. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've also rewritten the dialogue of um, people I interviewed in order to be able to protect them so that they didn't get sent to jail, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in both cases, 
or in many of those cases where I do that, I find some way of reckoning with the viewer so that they have some sense of what it is that I'm doing. I, I may not do it right at the beginning. I may wait till the end to do it. Uh -huh. Like in, in um, zero days, you know, I, I have a, a kind of computerized avatar of a person from the NSA. And I don't cop till the end in okay. terms of how that person was constructed and why. Uh -huh. um, I have in Client Nine. I have an an actor who's playing uh, a, an interview subject, and the first time you're introduced, it's just as another interview subject. But I come around to it later on to explain. No, no, no. This is an actor uh -huh. who um, we got to say the lines of somebody who didn't want their identity disclosed. So. Yeah. I usually find a way to do it because uh -huh, uh -huh. um, I don't like the idea of fooling the audience, like making up archive uh -huh. and pretending it's real archive. I think that's bullshit. You can call it ecstatic truth. I just think it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fine line. That's a fine line. Yeah, there's a fine line. Yeah, yeah. But I, it, that said, I appreciate you know what he's getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because he often refers to the phone book. The phone book is full of facts, but it's not a very interesting read. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Werner is uh, amazing. He is. Know. He's amazing, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he's great. I mean, I you yeah. know I remember like his. Yeah, I, I've, I'm a huge admirer of his uh, of his films, but I don't always agree. Yeah, yeah. M me too. He, so, uh, interesting. I had a conversation yeah. with Werner Herzog, and we were talking about my film Citizen K which he hadn't seen yet because it wasn't finished. Yeah. But he knew about Khodorkovsky, and I believe his wife is Russian um, or, 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 or Russian heritage. And he was railing on about um, what a bastard Khodorkovsky was because he had taken such ruthless advantage of people as an oligarch and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a very angry way. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, we were talking about it. And then uh, about three minutes later, he turned to me and said, so with Hodakovsky, did you find him interesting? <laughs> Which I thought was so great. That's a, that's a real filmmaker. Yeah, that's because true. it's that's not, true. he's not, he's not thinking about this as a politician. Yeah. You know, on the one hand, he denounced them, but it's like, but he, but did you find him interesting? In other words, that's the filmmaker talking, which is, I'm curious. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, because yeah. nobody is a, a, is a kind of black hat, white hat kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned my favorite writer yesterday, Fyodor Dostoevsky, with this quote. How, how the darker the, the night, the brighter the stars. The brighter right. the stars. Dostoevsky also was first, I think, to describe the white bear problem. Are you familiar with it? The which? The white bear problem. No. Basically, it's the problem uh, where if you decide not to think about the white bear, you will think about it even more. Right, and I think that's actually interesting uh, the analogy to the world of documentary filmmaking, where there are a lot of things that are, you know, supposed to be hidden under the rug, right? So, are there topics like this where you feel that, like, the effort that the government, let's say, or authorities put into hiding things, make actually make them actually more visible? I mean. I've spent a lot of time making films about secrets, uh, why people keep secrets, why it's so important. It's a very hard problem to get at, but there are a few people who are now talking about it in books. There's a recent book called The Persuaders that is out there about something called radical canvassing, um, which is a way politically of going, or politically, but a, a way of people who say are abortion advocates, right? saying a woman should uh, be, you know, pro-choice, is what we would say. So, and going door to door, even, and talking to people who are extremely uh, against abortion at any cost. <laughs> the question is how to engage them as human beings so that you get to a place where, um, you're not fundamentally attacking their identity, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and so that you can begin to talk about the issue. So I guess the, it's, 
it's the whole idea of human psychology and politics that I feel is underdone. Um, there are many political films that are made, but they're just about politics, and they're not nearly enough about the human uh, about the human psychology that gives rise to intransigence, uh -huh. Uh -huh. authoritarianism, or and 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 when I say authoritarianism, authoritarian instincts uh -huh. uh, from all sorts of different perspectives, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So that's a complicated answer to a simple question, uh -huh. but I, I, more and more that's what I'm thinking about, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. is how to make films about the difficulty of connecting on a human level uh -huh. about complicated and difficult issues, because uh -huh. uh -huh. it becomes the problem of filmmaking in general, yeah. right? Yeah. Particularly documentary Pretty filmmaking. Much. You know, you can simply entertain which means that you've just bought somebody's time yeah. and they've been diverted, but they don't really think about anything. Mm -hmm. Or you can engage them, but if you engage them, I think the idea of changing somebody's mind with a film instantly is too simple. The, the, that almost never happens. Oh, I saw this film and I completely changed my mind. Yeah, yeah. But they may start to think, yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you create a film that's a kind of a sacred space that allows people to engage in debates with themselves uh -huh. about what's going on, that's, uh, that's, that's hugely valuable. Because otherwise, particularly in the area of so-called political films, you end up making commercials for points of view. It doesn't seem useful to me or interesting. And so I guess I'm thinking more and more about how to forge human connections while still retaining strong principles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love this answer. Thank you very much. Like, Thank you. I, I, I will just ask one last question, which, which again will be selfish. <laughs> so what do you look for in an editor? A strong point of view, but also a willingness to engage in dialogue. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for my editors, I don't want the editor to sit there and say, so what would you like me to do? For me, the editors are, are people who wade into the material. The good editors are the people who wade into the material and also see things that I may have missed um, when I'm shooting. Because I may think something's great or that's my memory. And yeah. they say, well, actually, it was pretty boring. Or just the opposite. I may think, well, I felt like I didn't really get there. They say, no, 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 the look in, in her eye was fantastic says it all. and it <laughs> says it all this is a this is a magical moment yeah um and uh and but the the, and the other thing i look for in editors too are people who are invested in dramatic structure yeah because the hardest thing to get right in the documentary is structure mm -hmm. yeah um and then you can worry about the the details mm -hmm. but the structure of the story you know so those are the those are my heroes Thank you. Thank you. I love it. A great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> By the way, I also interviewed the legendary film and sound editor Walter Merch. So watch that video next. Huge thanks to nofilmschool.com and the Kamer Image Film Festival for providing me with this opportunity.